I wanted to speak to you, brothers and sisters, about instructing and reminding. A wise man once said, you know, our Christian audience doesn't need to be instructed as much as they need to be reminded. They know what is there as the bridge to life, the truth of the gospel. But if you look at the Roman church of the first century, they needed to be instructed because they had never heard anything like this before. And so we're going to go through what will be reminding for you, but will be instructive for the Roman church. And as I was putting together the message this week, I asked the Lord to help me to make such a clarity of the message that we can all come together in the Holy Spirit and be better witnesses of the gospel. As we begin to discuss Romans chapter 2, we realize that we are speaking about Christian doctrine here. Romans is the book of Christian doctrine. And so that's a technical theological word that we need a little help with sometimes. And so doctrine is the teaching of a strategic set of beliefs. That is what doctrine is. And you look at this word strategic and you think, okay, how can I wrap my brain around that? Well, strategy comes from the Greek word strategia. And strategia is the plan to achieve long-term goals under conditions of uncertainty. The plan to achieve long-term goals under conditions of uncertainty. Well, isn't that what we have in our world today? You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but it will happen and sometimes I've heard uh, some of our folks today say, I had a really good week. And then others say, oh, I had a really challenging week. And, uh, and, and, and so we don't know. But we do know that God is in control of all of that. And so we praise him. And you'll notice that I've uh, sort of given a, a bigger font to the word church over here in the beginning. You are church. And so it's C-H, you are C-H. And so Romans 2 talks about this strategic set of beliefs. Now last week we introduced this circle with the, uh, that, that, that is sort of iconic of no or don't go there or do not enter. And this represents our world. And the Bible tells us what reality is. And I'm not burying the lead here, ladies and gentlemen. In the next 10 minutes, we're going to go through absolutely everything you need to know, not only to have salvation, but to be able to present this strategy of our set of beliefs in this uncertain world. So the Bible says right from the outset that we live in a dark world. But Paul had already said in chapter 1, we're without excuse, and he's going to say it again, we're without excuse because we have sin and sins. And that's very important doctrinally to understand. You'll notice we've got sort of the, the snake eye uh, representing Satan on this side. We have inherent sin because we rebelled against God. And so from Adam and Eve we have sin that's inherent sin and we have sins that we 
do sins of omission and sins of commission that we do all the time. And we ask the Lord to help us with those sins, not to do those sins, as well as to thank him for covering over with the blood of Jesus Christ our inherent sin against him. And so we realize the reality of the Holy Bible saying this is a dark world in which we live. But also in Ecclesiastes 3.11 it says that everything is beautiful in its time. This is uh, the first 10 verses of Ecclesiastes 3 is where it says to everything turn, turn, turn. Turn. There is a season. Turn, turn, turn. And it talks about all these opposites of life and death and good and evil and how everything turns out, which is the turn, turn, turn. It turns out to be beautiful in its time. Why? Because it's pointing us to the ultimate goal for ourselves. Everything is beautiful in its time, but it also says, and it, it infers, that it's inexplicably beyond us. It's inexplicably beyond us. Life, where does that come from? Death, where does that come from? All evil, where does that come from? All the good and the beautiful, where does that come from? And it's inexplicably beyond me. We've got this little picture of DNA blown up. Now, we have come to a point in society where we can actually count chemically and designate DNA. And every person's DNA is different from another person. That's why we can do DNA identity these days. But what we don't understand, even though we can look at it and we can count it chemically. We can't see it, of course, but we can count it chemically. And each one of these little nodules within each DNA is a little machine. It's a little protein building machine. How did a machine get in there? And we say, and this is the symbol for God, Theos, uh, that, that God created even the little machines, the little protein building machines that are within the DNA that we can't see, we can't count, and scientists will tell you they don't know how it works. We can just see that it's there. And it does work. And it builds all of the building blocks of our lives. And so, in Ecclesiastes 3.11, the second half of that verse says, And God put eternity in the hearts of men. He put eternity in the hearts of men. And that is trying to answer, all of us are trying to answer, what happens when I die? What happens when I die? You ever had that thought? I bet you have. Maybe more often than you even should have that thought. Eternity was put in the hearts of men. Now that sounds great from the Bible, but do we have any evidence of God putting eternity in the hearts of men? Well, I, I think we do. Just recently, in the last few years, on Orkney Island, which is the tippy-top of Scotland, the edge of the world, still today, going out into the North Atlantic Oceanic Mass is this island. And there's a, been found a temple complex that they're excavating there. And they've been able to see from analyzing the, the rocks and all that was going on, and all the pottery and all the things that were there, that this is a temple complex from 3500 B.C. Now, we don't think of way up there and out there as having that kind of thought or that kind of um, uh, ritual and those kinds of uh, uh, ceremonies 
that they're saying happened on Orkney Island in 3500 BC. That's the same time period as the pyramids, which we think of as the apex of that of, of civilization during that time. They were both done at the same time. In the middle of civilization in the Mediterranean world, at the same time, people were having temple complexes on Orkney Island at the end of the world. Interesting, no? It was to me. And people have been trying with eternity in their hearts to answer the question, what happens when I die? And can I be well off with the Creator? So, Paul comes to the Romans and he says, I have the answer. The Lord has given me the answer. And we looked at a, this a little bit last week, but I want to go through the whole circle with you. And this is something that You'll want to remember, we're going to, we're going to revisit it again, so not to worry. The Bible says that reality in this lost world is that we don't have any excuse because through Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior, which is what that fish emblem means in Greek, Jesus Christ, God's Son and Savior, we have redemption through justification. And then that justification leads us to restoration. Restoration to what? Restoration of what we were invented for in the, in the beginning, what we were created for, to be men and women connected to God through our spirits and since he created us in his image as spirit he wants to restore us to full family communication with him don't you love it when those of you all who are, are who have children and grandchildren when you go to see your grandchildren they come running up to you grandma grandpa and that it just fills your soul with, uh, with, with this gratitude that they would love you like that. And, and so that's what God says when we come to the point where we're justified and we're going to be restored. We say, God, thank you. We're so glad to be in your family. And so that restoration then, through restoration is sanctification. So we're in this life, in this world, we're going through a process of restoration through sanctification. And we've talked a little bit about sanctification, how we go through that process. Now that's not salvation. Salvation happened up here. But then we're so grateful to God our Father to want to restore us that we become sanctified throughout our lives. And that sanctification then leads to rewards. Rewards here and rewards in heaven. And don't you feel when you come in here on Sunday morning and you see your brothers and sisters that you haven't seen maybe for a week and they come up and want to hug your neck and want to find out what happened in your, during your week. And that's reward. I, I know I love that. I like getting a reward that way. But there's also this rewarding leads through to glorification. That's when we die and we become glorified in the sight of the Lord. Our spirits go to be with him and so there's also going to be a fourth R when we get there. Uh, realm. We're in the realm of the Father. And so this is all you need to express to people what reality is in the world. Now they might not accept it. And many won't. But this is what we're supposed to give to them. How can man be saved. That's it. Now Paul is going to talk about as we get into the 
into the chapter here, which we will shortly, about Gentiles being in that group as well as Jews being in that group. But here's what we're going to see as we read. We're going to see that Jesus has said that Christians are both Gentiles and Jews. John 10, 16. Now that is one I want us to read before we ever get to Romans. And I have it here. You may want to turn to it. Uh, Romans 10, 16. And let's back 14, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And so Jesus is already teaching before he ever goes to the cross that the Jews are one flock in one pen, but he's got another flock, and that's the Gentiles that will all be Christians together as one flock under one shepherd. What's, gonna, what's happening here and what Paul is writing about, he's telling all of that, but he's also saying, now, some of you are confused, and you're confused because you're having issues and I want to lay those issues to rest before I ever come and visit you and so here's that what's happening is that between redemption and justification the Jews are saying hey you you got to be Jewish Jewishness helps you be justified so that you can work toward restoration well that's a roadblock that's a roadblock to what God is trying to do. And it's not a fulfillment. It's a roadblock. Because guess what? Nobody can do it. Now that the Messiah has come, you have to, if you want to be Jewish, you have to fulfill all the laws. But one of those laws is to wait and watch for the Messiah. So you can't do that without rejecting Christ. So Paul's saying, it can't work. Anybody who's trying to tell you to be Jewish is telling you the wrong thing. It's no longer operable. And not only that, but Jewishness as a part of restoration going into sanctification actually blocks the Holy Spirit. Because see, Jewishness says follow all these rules, follow all these laws, make all these sacrifices, do all of these things in the right order at the right time, even though you're not anywhere near the temple, and you will be saved. Well, it keeps us from having the Holy Spirit in our hearts to say how we should be sanctified. Is that making sense? And so it's not only a, a roadblock to salvation, it's a roadblock to sanctification. And Paul is saying, no, 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 do not go there. So this whole thing as being one flock and one shepherd, Paul says, this is my gospel. This is my gospel. This is what I teach as opposed to any of that. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. You may have heard of a book that came out some years ago by Billy Graham's grandson that says, that has this title, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. He also says, Jesus plus everything equals nothing. If you're going to believe in everything, not Jesus. You can't believe in everything and Jesus. Because that's nothing. And so, we see that this is reality and the truth of the Bible and the truth of all of our experience. Now, after all that, we're going to get to Romans 2, 1 through 11. Let me read. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. 
Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? Wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he's done. To those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and those who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Okay, we've got some words in here that we have to kind of work through a little bit. But work through here. What was happening we can see is that the Jews, every time Paul was saying, you've got to be good, you've got to be good, you've got to do good, the Jews were saying, Amen, which is the Hebrew for where we get Amen, uh, which means certainly, I agree, I agree, Amen. Well, their word was Omain. They were sitting back there going, Omain, Omain, that's right. We have to do good. We have to be good. Well, they're looking at that sin, where we call it sins, but they weren't looking at the sin that they inherited. And so Paul is saying, wherefore, which is the Greek word deal, which in this context means in your own way, you do the same thing. You're saying to the Gentiles, oh, come to this church and become a Jew and then you'll be all right with God. And Paul is saying in your own way, you, you Jews of the congregation may think that just because you're Jews by blood, you can go along to get along and still be righteous. Better think again. Now that's the McCormick Revised Version. And uh, so you'll want to look up that in your lexicon and all of that. Um, but here's what was happening. Just because you're Jews by blood, you can go along to get along. What does that mean? All right, here's what was happening. You know, we looked at the map before of Rome. And we eat life. They had stadiums and they had coliseums. Of course, in the first century, they didn't have the coliseum yet uh, because it was built... Um, by Titus uh, after um, uh, at the end of the first century but nevertheless that's the map we've got but they've eventually had it but they had paved roads they had commerce they had plunder from those that they had uh, had conquered they had banking they had trade tribute and aqueducts and they were the elite life they were the elite city of the whole world and ruled the whole world and so what has that got to do with the Jews well what was happening was the Jews were the enablers of the elite life they were coming to the Christian church on Sunday and talking about all of these things about eternal life and Christianity and it's part of Jewishness because Jesus was a Jew and all of that. And then during the week, they were using, they were the bankers. They were using the plunder and the commerce from the tribute to be the bankers and the go-between of all of the Gentiles who were doing business selling slaves and all of the different uh, temple prostitution and everything that they were doing, the Jews were saying, we're not a part of that. Just handle the money. It's just business. Right? And so they were part of the problem. And Paul is saying, you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. You, if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to come out of that. Well, it's very hard when your elite, comfortable life is threatened by coming out of it. 
And that's a lesson for us today too. We have to realize that prayer is so important because so many people that we know, so many people that we don't know, they are stuck in that and they have to come to a point where they step out of that and realize that God is going to still protect them in life. And so Paul is saying, no, no, no. You're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. Now, let's go to verses 12 through 16. <clears throat> all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it's those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. Since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them, this will take place on the day when God will judge men's secret, secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. And so what we can boil all of that down to saying that Paul is saying, this is the gospel I follow. Those who obey the law are righteous if they actually do it, which they can't at this point, at this juncture. Most of them never did, even before the Messiah came. And he says, when Gentiles follow through faith in Jesus, follow God through faith in Jesus with their hearts and conscience, God considers them righteous. And he's going to follow that up with an analogy next week about Abraham. And so there's, he's saying, look, let's all get together on this one thing. If you're going to praise Jesus and you're going to be in a Christian church that praises the Christ, you've got to understand that it's the heart. And he says on judgment day, there'll be no secrets and all will be judged through Jesus Christ. And so the Jews have to say, I've got to get rid of all of that other stuff. And that's what John chapter 10, which we read a few uh, verses from, tells us. Now, let's move on to um, 2, 17 through 29. And this is a little bit of a long um, passage to read, but follow along with me and we'll finish out the chapter. Now, if you call yourself a Jew... If you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, you who commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? And that's a direct result of them being the bankers for the temples. You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it's written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You're not only being righteous, you're are, are, are acting like you're righteous, you're actually impeding Gentiles from becoming Christians. Verse 25. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. If those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, they will not be regarded as, they, as though they were circumcised. Will they not be um, regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision are a lawbreaker. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, 
nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. So what Paul is saying here is he's, he's centering on circumcision because they, the Jews that were preaching this in the Christian church, were, were, were saying, hey, all you Gentiles, you want to become Christians, you've got to be circumcised first. Where have we heard that before? In every one of Paul's letters, the Jews are following him around and preaching this becoming a Jew. And he's saying... Arrogance signifies you're not righteous. You're talking to everybody else and down your nose at them because you are part of God's chosen people and God does not recognize that. And even Jesus, when he went into the temple, you know, there were these huge courts that were called what? The court of the Gentiles. That's where the Gentiles were supposed to be able to come and hear the praise of the Lord from the court of the Israelites and the sacrifices and hear the reality of the truth of the one true God. But they had made it a den of thieves, as Jesus said. So he overturned their tables that were filling up the court of the Gentiles and making such a raucous roar that the Gentiles couldn't hear. And so, even Jesus was talking about it and doing something about it in those days. Those guys were circumcised too, that were the money changers in the temple. Was Jesus pleased with that? I say no. And what does this have to do with Jesus' words to be humble, caring, gentle, giving, loving, truthful, and counseling? The bedrock characteristics of God the Father. What's happening is the Jews were using their Jewishness and they were saying, hey, you Gentiles, we'll lift you up. We'll help you through the obstacle course. Uh, we got a staff Jew that's going to help everybody over. And uh, we got Jews at the top that are going to help you get over there. But you got to get over that obstacle with the law. You can't go around it. You got to go through it with our help because we're so neat. We're the people of God. And so uh, they were... The, the, the Gentiles were going, oh, I guess I can make it. I'm not sure if I can make it. I got to work harder. I got to work harder. Well, that's the devil's work that you work for your salvation. So this thing is circumcision. Circumcision is meant to signify that you're truly God's obeying people. You've obeyed enough to be to, to get that sacrificial act done. Your, your family was when you were born. And Paul says only circumcised in heart counts now that the Messiah has come. You don't have to do that stuff anymore. Messiah has come. And so it was circumcision was for the responsible male only. No circumcision for women. It was for the responsible male in the household only. And it was deeply personal. So that every day the man who's the responsible person in the household reminds his heart because of his body that he is to obey God. That's what it was for. And now that the Messiah has come and given us all of the teaching and all of the experience of him working in the world and his sacrifice, that's what's supposed to remind our hearts now. And so here's the battle zone for restoration, which is where we all are right now and where they were too. The battle zone for restoration is saying in our spirit, soul, and body all together that we're a 14er. We are humble, caring, gentle, giving, loving, truthful, counseling. I left a D off there. And we deny and discipline our body with pride, envy, sloth, greed, lust, wrath, and gluttony, marginalized and finally mortified in our lives. And this is God's character, and this is man's fallen bent. Right? And so, 
I got a little cartoon to bring, <laughs> bring a little levity to this. It says, uh, this is a guy, uh, we know that Peter's not at the gate of heaven necessarily, but that's the, the rumor. And so he says, you were a believer, yes, but you skipped the not being a jerk about it part. <laughs> and so we have a lot of people these days that are church abused. Just like the Jews were abusing the Christians that were Gentiles that were trying to come and be right in their lives. We have a lot of people who become church. So a lot of people that you meet will say, I'm not in the church, boy, you saw those Christians. You know, let me tell you a few stories about the Christians that I've met. Well, they do it. They're doing just like the Jews. They're impeding the gospel rather than boosting it by being people that are too legalistic or too snooty, too arrogant. And that can't be us, right? And so we have to take those church abused and say, hey, watch me over time. Watch me over time and you'll want to come be part of this family. Finally, as we finish this up, since we've read through chapter 2, we have this clash of worldviews. Pilate said, you are a king then. And Jesus answered, you're right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born. I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. From John chapter 18. And that Greek phrase there, the truth, is e alitheus, which means the reality. Everyone on the side of the reality listens to me. And that's what Paul is instructing. And that's what we need to be reminded of in our day through the Bible. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be humble in heart. Are you humble in heart? We're supposed to reach out. Are you reaching out? And I know that we do in this church. There's a lot of reaching out going on for as small as we are. Are you teaching? Are you teaching those that are in your sphere of influence about the principles and the heartbeat of God? And are you praying? Jesus did when he was here. He reached out. He taught. He prayed. And he had a humble heart to the point where he sacrificed his own life for his followers. And so it ends up, guess what? We've changed colors. We're now instead of red in this world that's a dark world of woe, we're now royal purple because this is our circle of reality and Jesus plus nothing is everything. Next week, we will study Romans chapter 3. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the Apostle Paul and for those who have given us Greek dictionaries and lexicons and uh, the studying that we can benefit from to understand exactly what Paul was saying and how he's saying that Jesus, our Savior and Lord, plus nothing equals everything for our goal of glorification. And as we're being restored, Lord, help us to be restored to what you want us to be, each and every one, in order to receive the war rewards and glorification through salvation in Jesus Christ. And we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen.